Hello everyone, welcome to this uh, channel of Course of Philosophy. Greetings from Ukraine, glory to Ukraine. Uh, this is the second lecture uh, about the ancient philosophy. So in this, uh, uh, let's uh, briefly, let's look at the course content about uh, lectures. Uh, so the previous lecture, the first lecture, was the introduction. Uh, consider an introduction about the general definitions and outline of the map of philosophy. So we just view uh, by its surface all the main principles and uh, terms and thoughts about logic, reasoning, and other things. So this lecture is about ancient philosophy. <coughs> This is the second lecture, and uh, it, uh, I'm going to tell about the period of history, uh, let's say, uh, 7 before Christ and uh, 15 after Christ. And, uh, within that period, <coughs> um, then uh, the next lecture after that, uh, the lecture third, will be about the Middle Ages epoch, since let's say about 5 uh, uh, AD to the 16 AD, uh, and the last one about uh, our historical part, it is a uh, uh, la uh, lecture uh, fourth uh, about 17 19th centuries. Considered separate, separate sections is our half of our course. So this is a logic and epistemology, metaphysics and ontology, ethics and more philosophy. So the, uh, the last one uh, maybe should be a uh, uh, lecture before all that, but uh, as we usually do, we try to follow uh, those parts uh, in a way that uh, we try to <coughs> tell about those parts uh, historically. <coughs> okay. Contents of the previous lecture. The previous lecture identified subject of philosophy, the system, man, world, nature. So about this general view of the world. Uh, its methods uh, are general. Which one? Uh, let's say metaphysical and dialectical. Um, mostly, of course, it's just metaphysical methods, and uh, its sections uh, are branches of philosophy, which are metaphysics, ontology, epistemology, logic, ethics, value theory, or the theory of value, or uh, sometimes as aesthetics, social philosophy, and philosophy of science. Uh, for each section, uh, the characteristics of how and why the section is defined were specified. So let's briefly name all those uh, terms. Metaphysics, that outside of physics, the common, uh, the most common uh, philosophical section. So about more more general questions like, for example, about space and time, and so on. Ontology, a section that studies the existing, or what exists, what being is. Epistemology, a section that that studies cognition, or how to understand something is about knowledge, how to know something. Logic, a section that studies inference and uh, how something can be inferred from something. Let's say a set of elements can be uh, derived from others' sentence, uh, set of elements. Ethics, uh, this branch studies morality and its consequences. Uh, the theory of values, a section that studies Aesthetics, categories like that, for example, uh, what has a value of something, or what makes something be valuable. Social philosophy that studies society, as uh, of course philosophy category, and philosophy of science that studies the concepts of science or the concept of scientists, uh, something like that. Okay, part one, ancient philosophy. Ancient uh, philosophy, uh, like most of humanity, is passed about the emergence of the phenomenon of philosophy. Uh, nothing is known for sure. 
of course we <laughs> we cannot be sure about what philosophy is however we keep studying it uh, even having uh, some fuzzy some unspecified term we can distinguish some periods in ancient philosophy because we try to be based on some other uh, historical events uh, philosophy of ancient East uh, this uh, takes a longer period it's about um, a period that uh, held even uh, in 12th century or more uh, earlier uh, till 7th century um, before Christ an ancient philosophy uh, or mostly the Greek philosophy ancient Greek philosophy um, and uh, partially is a Roman uh, philosophy stoics all right ancient philosophy uh, let's t take a look at some brief uh, features brief characteristics about each of those major uh, uh, major branches major parts because our uh, this dividing into those part east west is kind of um, it's kind of non usual and uh, of course it it has some gaps usually there are no <laughs> east west in uh, such uh, understanding however um, to conceptualize this is is easy it's it's like you know something like for example right or left politics usually divided however there are no left or right there are just something bizarre or something fuzzy we cannot be certain about something all right oriental philosophy or the east philosophy a philosophy that goes tries to mostly mostly goes beyond it's something like more like theology uh, uh, it is close connection with myths or myth making uh, sometimes um, mythological or uh, intuition or kind of things are more common for oriental philosophy let let's take it as an example example uh, such a procedure in medicine like uh, when needles uh, put in the body uh, I forgot the correct name about that uh, but anyway so the needles in the body like a medical method yeah so in oriental world uh, let's say in China this method is accepted whether uh, I'd say that uh, most of other Western medicine perhaps uh, the major medicine facilities are rather uh, rejected because they say mm, there are no those you know like forces that transfer through those needles or something like that however in the oriental philosophy all those concepts are uh, too close together and that's why uh, uh, those concepts is tied closely to the general philosophy <coughs> so that's why it would be not so good to reject such a method and of course uh, th uh, this may be um, comprehended I understand why this procedure is um, not be rejected so this is something like an example from this uh, however um, mm, uh, we can conceptualize this saying like uh, from religion to religion it's something like uh, closer to more re religious aspects however uh, those views are also not so good because uh, when we try to conceptualize this in this way it doesn't work really well of course it's, it's, it's another representation of ours uh, so what what 
uh, what does it mean on those uh, from religion to religion concepts it can be divided into three categories like for example transcendent supernatural or intuitive as I said intuitive is more uh, common uh, related to Oriental philosophy or East philosophy supernatural and transcendent uh, on the other hand the ancient Greek philosophy or the vast philosophy mm, as philosophy they came out or almost separated from mythology or, or tried uh, being separated from them and something like maybe I don't know but mm, maybe not necessarily atheistic however uh, more closely to uh, atheistic understanding the concepts of uh, from myth to logos from from myth to logos uh, what is it is a matter space or logos uh, logos or logo anyway it, it can be said uh, either way uh, uh, instead of mm, retelling those stories about your past or, or present uh, and to use for example a form like a fairy tale or something like that, something um, uh, really dignitive, some, something like uh, stories about heroes, uh, Western type of thinking in the, the, those period of history was like, uh, no, that story is just that story. So instead of just retelling the text, uh, it is important to try to describe it in a way, in another, in another way. So those elements of text are not less important than the whole text. However, the East philosophy, as it seems, just seems, uh, like they try to take a whole text as a primary source, not like the elements of text. And uh, maybe this one of explanation and matter of space and, and it this mean this the the world within that whole cosmos within the universe all those elements are combined together in some way and uh, studying them is important okay let's take uh, uh, we will try to look briefly only to few of schools or views uh, in that uh, more ancient period and the first one is Chinese philosophy I'll just briefly take a look at this so what is it is rethinking mythological models uh, uh, piece while preserving her uh, general structures uh, okay so there are the myths and uh, uh, mostly that philosophy tries to retell about those things uh, myths uh, so this is just another retelling of those myths uh, <clears throat> what is that energy or this energy yeah? is about uh, the energy uh, this uh, or the energy of that is the most common or basic something that um, is spread all over the whole universe so all the universe each part of it has that this energy that energy <clears throat> and let's say the structure or something uh, of that force it can be divided into two major groups of yin and yang and those yin and yang uh, um, this uh, w w something that works with it is really important and that's why uh, all the universe mm, can be represented in that famous symbol yin and yang yeah that curved black and white symbol with uh, one circle one curve two inner circles and uh, I mean, you know, all right. 
those forces are bivalence. They are two opposites, which are, for example, love and hate, tension, calm, harmony and amity, or action in an action, or oh, calmness. So the opposites. So those opposites exist in that way. That world also can be represented as those oppositions. Uh, if you study philosophy and you uh, see lots of schools during the history, you can for for yourself you can divide it into two major categories: those who tries to take the world as something like opposition or bivalence, and those others. I mean, are the other ones. So those who tries to uh, view the world in, in, through the oppositions, mostly dialectical type, it, not necessary. However, it's quite almost quite the same. I mean, uh, their logic uh, more or less repeat them. However, those who do not think like uh, that, uh, they use some other methods. And it seems that Chinese philosophy. Uh, was closer to that. Mm. However, however, personally, I uh, don't think that those dividing world into oppositions is a very good way. Mm. It's uh, it's just um, a comfortable uh, conceptualization, nothing more for me. But it doesn't mean that. For example, the folk of Chinese or maybe Chinese philosophy uh, is not deep or something. No, no, no. It's, of course, it's a very honorable, very uh, profound idea. Uh, I mean, uh, the views about the oppositions uh, uh, or ambivalence uh, uh, can be found even in the 20th century or uh, even today when we uh, say about the politics, let's say left, right or something. Those dividedness, as my own opinion, is something like you know, like the error <laughs> in our mm, uh, consciousness. <laughs> but maybe, maybe I'm wrong. You know, those concepts, like for example, black and white, or those other opposites. It's just something, something like uh, let's take, let's take an error in our genes. <laughs> maybe I'm wrong, but. It's, it's like it seems for me. Okay, so this whole system can be represented in three: heaven, yeah, man, a person, yeah, and a man. I mean, I mean, a human, and earth. So a man is the person, yeah, something that like interactions between yin and yang. Earth is like um, how. That human, the man, can um, interact with something. Yeah, interacting Earth and heaven uh, is also the opposite to it. Man cannot interact with heaven. Uh, maybe uh, now, but um, his actions with Earth is um, have some inferences it uh, it links to the heaven so the system is combined of course and and i, I also want to admit that uh, this whole system is tied just you know there are no spare elements each element is like have its own part its own place it's like you know for example it's like a kingdom where each pawn uh, each uh, servant or anyone else has its own place. It occupies it, and he just do what uh, he must do. All right, Confucius, uh, one of famous philosoph uh, Chinese philosophers. Only briefly, only briefly. We just want to remember him first of all. Uh, he lived uh, around seventh uh, century uh, BC, and uh, uh, so what he said, he tried to explain those laws of uh, government to people through some conceptions. 
just as I said, brief look. Uh, he left uh, uh, wrote written book uh, Long Yun, uh, and uh, he told about some Zhen Zhen uh, concept. This Zhen concept, uh, for me, uh, briefly to say about this, isn't so easy. However, if to remember, like for example, uh, such sages as Socrates or maybe some other sages in the history we can uh, we can find that uh, they had been teaching uh, preaching about uh, some so being a human like a human must be a human something uh, very human something very nature to the human so this gen is something like that something like like life like life but life uh, I mean being life full like uh, the person with gen it is something like a representation inside a person of this life something really um, lifeness and of course what uh, about what he also told about <laughs> Bedian's truth whether uh, some of um, researchers about his uh, works uh, uh, didn't uh, talk only about his uh, his saying about the obedience. No, not only that. Obedience. Uh, he, he also said many other things. Like you know, there there were some uh, counter examples or uh, uh, something uh, inconsistency. All right. Uh, also, briefly, if you look at two schools in Indian philosophy, Indian philosophy um, may be took as Vedic period, yes, yeah, so it's ancient period, identification of nature and man, substantially unity, but many things. Uh, those Vedic period was uh, were like mm, about many uh, concepts. There were many terms and so on. However. Of course, as we know that um, those scripts uh, hadn't been saved, uh, they've been lost. However, there were tellers or retellers who remembered all this and retelled all that. Because uh, mostly uh, those traditions were not written, it was told. It was told. So, I mean, um, uh, those terms were held in mind and so on. And like uh, those things as nature, substantiality, unity, or something, were known in that period. But classical period, there were some schools like Nyaya, Vaisheshika, Samkhya, and Pan, uh, Patanjali. Uh, but we all try to brief only two of them. Uh, logic of Nyaya school. Uh, only about that logic. Uh, we want to admit something uh, because uh, maybe before the 20th century, uh, most of logic studies includes epistemology. So studying logic was also like studying epistemology. Uh, the semantic level or the basic ground were really close to that. And that's why we can see those not only formal elements, but uh, also informal elements in that um, studies. And uh, uh, what was that uh, school about? Liberation uh, of the soul from the control of the body. Uh, separation of I as an entity. Epistemolo uh, epistemological categories. There were 16 categories. 16. Just imagine it. Not only like, for example, in uh, Aristotle, ten, yeah, but uh, sixteen categories. Uh, we won't list them. Uh, there are no need for that. What about knowledge? What well, they tell about knowledge? Uh, it's to separate what you know from what you do know, don't know. Of course, I mean, this is, by the way, uh, really interesting. Uh, however, uh, uh, one thought came to, into my mind. You know, uh, 
uh, I, maybe I should uh, uh, say about it later uh, during the period of Socrates. However, uh, now I can remember that in famous words of Socrates, I know that I know nothing. Yeah, uh, you two uh, combine those two. I mean, using conjunction, uh, this phrase. I mean, uh, this uh, law rule in the logic of Nyaya school and that thought of Socrates. What will it be? <laughs> what will it have? <laughs> we can derive an uh, uh, empty set from it. The empty set. Because uh, what can be? Yeah, <laughs> we don't know nothing, so uh, what, what can we separate nothing from nothing? Huh? So, uh, nothing. However, uh, what we don't know is the universe. <laughs> it's really interesting, yeah, some kind of a paradox. Okay. And uh, also important thing is separate knowledge and perceptions. Uh, I mean, this uh, uh, this rule signifies or notifies uh, that Indian philosophers, or maybe a part of them, of course, were aware of uh, two, at least two levels of sensations. Like, for example, there are some senses, yeah, perceptions. And there is some kind of a rational level. This is also important. I mean, you know, our part of lecture uh, mostly about the Western philosophy. However, e this is one of the sign that the East philosophy isn't, uh, you know, mm, uh, isn't so narrow or maybe so mythological as we can see. Mostly of them, it was based on some mythology or maybe uh, had more mythological elements than, uh, for example, Western philosophy. However, however it doesn't mean that uh, what they told in those times uh, was not like today. Okay, so an anamana is inference, is an example of inference. If you're familiar with Aristotle logic or uh, the structure of um, syllogism, uh, you can find here, but with two added elements. So instead of uh, three um, lines or phrases in Aristotle syllogistic system, or three premises, here are five premises or, or five phrases, as you wish. For example, fire is burning on a mountain. Is some kind of a thesis. It's like something that we want to claim because there is a smoke. So there's a reason. Yeah, there is a smoke. Then there is a fire. Uh, and uh, this is the third one. Uh, inhale condition. Uh, the cause of smoke uh, on the mountain is fire. Some alteration of the thesis. It's like recombination of it. So therefore, the fire is burning on the mountain. So conclusion. So. This is our conclusion. Something the same. All right, let's start. Uh, let's get this party started. <laughs> Ancient Greek philosophy. That's part two. Uh, briefly, characteristic and chronology of ancient philosophy, political and social systems, change of antiquity, pre-Socratic period, classical period, uh, so-called period Hellenism. Uh, some separate ancient schools and teachings, Neoplatonism and the end of ancient era. Of course, uh, this period is quite long because maybe from 7th century to the 3rd uh, century, yeah, after Christ, I see, 10th century, yeah, there were many different uh, thoughts, too many. Uh, <laughs> to tell them briefly. Uh, in, uh, I want to say the next. Now, I, I, I want, I'm going uh, to skip some of parts of this lecture, like about history, culture, and something. Uh, because uh, usually, for studying philosophy, 
one should uh, be prepared to know something from that period like you know having some historical and some um, cultural uh, elements I mean for example a person if he uh, is hearing uh, terms as for example ancient uh, ancient Greek or something uh, has to be aware of something uh, from history from that period that there were some for example Greek uh, cities and there were um, uh, something Greek system in some kind of a, a different interaction between those cities and how people lived uh, what were those cultural elements like anchors for example I mean vases yeah or mythology something be aware of it like maybe uh, you is aware of um, you are aware of uh, familiar with uh, um, some myths uh, or mythology about Zeus and his other gods or something the structure so this is all good and uh, this is uh, an important but uh, not <laughs> important for study philosophy I mean you can study philosophy without all that however if you want to uh, uh, get it closer you can try to find a history and culture culture so one major point uh, if you want to study philosophy you can skip it always history culture but uh, as being um, uh, being uh, people uh, a person who wants to know more to understand some things or to try to understand to comprehend some things should be aware of that uh, culture and history mm. all right so that's why I skip some of them like you know you can uh, see uh, some pictures of those city you can see some uh, events mm. like for example at those times Greek you study Homer his famous Iliad and Odyssey and so on uh, this is one of possible maps by the way it was taken from book Bertram Russell uh, mm. let me guess this is book uh, just one sec aha uh -huh. Wisdom of West. Wisdom of West. Historical survey of Western and its uh, Western philosophy and its social and political settings. Um, it didn't say which year, but this is the, uh, as I said, uh, the wisdom of the West. Bertrand Russell. And. Uh, Uh, so, uh, as you can see, there are many cities, yeah, of um, Greek. As I say, you you can skip all that because uh, this is just the other part. However, briefly to remember those things is is not unnecessary. Uh, um, there were some some maybe social uh, things, as for example, trading or Maybe you know, like for example, uh, those, all those tragedies, theaters, mm, chanting about that, so on. Also, you uh, you might be known with seven of sages who lived in uh, six or seven centuries uh, BC. Who are those ones? You know, for example, there is an important maybe an interesting thing uh, we're talking about philosophers but for example Confucius is was a philosopher yeah but for example uh, when Confucius lives there were some other peoples and even uh, the same about Greek for example why on earth Thales of Miletus who is the end of this list is the philosopher However, Anacharsis, uh, Biosis, Lindus, and P 
pit tuck and so on I know a philosopher <laughs> this is an important question so I mean where is the draw line uh, who divides all those uh, philosophers from non-philosophers by which principle by which way to understand that uh, it's important to uh, have in mind mm, that uh, there were some signs however it's not really easy to be certain in that however uh, this this part we try to understand for the prism of their activity uh, okay let's say something about also a quite historical part of that philosophy because without history um, it's hard to refuse and this thing might be important when you try to understand those uh, lines or uh, consequences why there was some order that list what which schools there were my little schools in which there we can find Thales, Anaximander, Anaximenes so on uh, there was also a lonely philosophy Heraclitus of Ephesus Pythagoras and Pythagorean skulls and uh, Iceland of Samos, uh, Eleatic school, like Permanides and Zeno, famous philosophers, natural philosophers and atomists, like for example Empedocles, uh, Anaxagoras, Democritus, and sophists. Uh, it's, uh, it's just uh, comfortable and sometimes it, it, it works nice when we divide those philosophers into some categories however uh, as I said those conceptualization are just one of possible but uh, of course for example mm -hmm. we cannot mm, uh, put Heraclitus into some other schools let's say for example to Miletus or uh, Pythagoreans because he had no um, similar uh, features similar ideas with them so that's why we should put him uh, into a uh, lone um, uh, way okay Thales of Miletus the first philosopher yeah first philosopher uh, he was a founder of my latest school. <clears throat> I mean, uh, he was the first who introduced that school. But which, uh, about what uh, that school was? About natural philosophy, <coughs> like for example, mythological way of understanding things. I wanted to find some logic behind it. Uh, which elements that universes consist of? Uh, why, for example, uh, the world is uh, made as it made, and so on. He lived, uh, let's say, seventh century and the mid of sixth uh, century. Uh, what he also is famous about his astronomy, his astronomy research is like uh, solar eclipse, and other things. Uh, they say he predicted that solar eclipse uh, in uh, 70, 50, uh, 53rd uh, year before Christ uh, <coughs> and by that case <coughs> you know his uh, year of life also Thales is famous about his uh, mathematical uh, researches uh, maybe if you are uh, into trigonometry or some um, is mathematics I mean like in school uh, you might have heard about his uh, theorems theorem of Thales about the angles <coughs> we can uh, theorem of angles that uh, angles are mm, 
have the same value and so on. All right, and the next one. So in this course, we just want to uh, try to um, put our attention to certain elements of the teachings of philosophers, like not uh, study the whole philosopher of each philosopher. Okay, it, it would be nice, but it, it, it would be one of possible ways. Uh, of course, I would say that uh, study uh, one person philosophy would be nice. However, uh, uh, that would be for more longer uh, or a series of lectures, not just in, in the course of philosophy. All right, but first of all, let's note that there is little information about the philosophy of Thales, and uh, there is a fragment uh, of his teachings, and this fragment is just a reconstruction, so we cannot be certain about his uh, very thoughts. We only reconstruct them, so that's why. We cannot be certain about whether or not Thales had this thought. However, if we skip away this thought, we can say that uh, what if, yeah, uh, Thales uh, said, we can reconstruct that. So historically, is not a very good point. However, for just consequences, it might be a not bad point. All right. First argument: Everything consists of water. All right. It's what is it? It's metaphysics. Why metaphysics? Because it's all about general things. Yeah, general things. We just want to understand uh, um, the core elements of universe or the whole. For Thales, the proof of this was that relative. He considered water to be the first and the main element, uh, and uh, that relative are presented everywhere. His reasoning, uh, reasoning according to the same was: a, any physical object contains uh, we, yeah, uh, the first premise. The second, water equals to we. Uh, third premise: everything consists of water. So we just combine all that. However, as you can see, his reasoning is wrong because the statement that any object has we uh, do not guarantee that uh, any object has something else, and therefore this is logically erroneous reasoning or false. Why so? Because uh, having uh, water as just an element doesn't mean there are no other elements. It, it, it does not prove that everything consists of water. It um, may prove that there is water. Mm, that's it. Nothing else. Or maybe it, it may prove that each element has water. But it doesn't mean that each that something does not have something else. So we cannot say that uh, there are no other parts in those parts. And that's why we cannot say that everything consists of water. But the thought of Thales was interesting. He's not famous about this thing, however we will stay in there. Why so? To be... Um, to look at her philosophy. Because you know, this course is also based uh, to make that philosophy representative, because uh, at the moment uh, we're trying to understand this, uh, the ancient Greek philosophy. All right, an examiner of Miletus, uh, exactly unknown when he uh, uh, the years of his life uh, is also known that uh, 45 years old uh, he had in uh, 465 year. PC. All right. Mm. He was uh, Thales' disciple. Uh, he developed uh, a doctrine of Apron or something continues. 
Uh, also in Genji, in astronomy, something says about that. Uh, however, his uh, preached about the astronomy was kind of, I would say, loony. <laughs> he just guessed about something. Not like, for example, Eratos Finis, who, who had measured the um, length of the Earth, yeah? But uh, Alexandrus, he just wondered about things. However, his astronomy was not an astronomy, but uh, had a look of that. And of, uh, he said something about evolution. Okay, philosopher of Anaximandrus. Uh, unlike the previous philosopher Thales, uh, now we have a statement about that. What 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 <laughs> what left? Uh, all right, let's read it. From what all things arise at the same time they are solved as needed, because they are punished for their wickedness, uh, wickedness, and receive revenge for each other at the appointed time <laughs> this uh, fragment know that in those days the transmission of thoughts this way was uh, was common I mean for example uh, people talked in that way <laughs> uh, for, for us is uh, something exotical yeah it, it seems to be exotical whether for those people in past uh, it, it was just a way of talking and you might know that uh, they were combined to something as logical or metaphysical and uh, something mythological, yeah? So this part is also can be named as metaphysical or nature of philosophy. And the second argument. The first substance may be neither water nor any other element. Okay, so... Anaximander, uh, <laughs> I think uh, he might uh, uh, be uh, wishing to tell that uh, his teacher, Thales, was wrong and his thought was kind of a contradiction. Why well, he was pointed at that? Because, premise point, if one element were the main one, it would be absurd all the others. Okay, let's it be the premise. The next premise. Water is the main element. It's like uh, taking that uh, a hypothesis of Tylees as the main one. Then everything is water. Uh, uh, those commentaries are like in style of Anaximander. I mean, uh, we try to reconstruct these thoughts, yeah? Uh, so he... Uh, might add. Uh, we see something else, namely that things are different, and not just one water. So th this is, uh, I mean, uh, this is what we see, yeah, that uh, the water is not <laughs> everything else is made of water. Maybe it's not. I mean, there are some other things. Like, for example, water is water, and uh, something like, for example, fire is not water. All right, the fourth premise. But not everything is water, therefore, fifth one. Water is not the main element. Be, um, uh, let's stop here to comprehend one thing. Uh, the first, the very first premise of uh, Anaximander, if, the one, uh, if one element were the main one, it would absorb all the others. We might be guessing, would it be wrong or true? Uh, but this uh, absorption is like, uh, you know, uh, something can be reconstructed, but it doesn't mean it is a true. However, it one of possible reconstructions, and um, we can say that uh the thoughts of uh, Thales was wrong thinking that everything is water but what then can it be said that water or something else is the element and uh, 
because you know this i mean the first premise may be guessed i mean it doesn't mean that uh an examiner thought about that we can say about for example about the premise two three four four five that uh, it was something like in his head whether we cannot say that the first one was however it, it doesn't really mean because why and uh, let's go further to the uh, third argument this argument tells us that primary substance neutral neutral okay we can uh, see under the f of the sixth premise if the basic element the infinite it would cover all others so this is that reinterpretation of the first premise this infiniteness would cover all others then the second one there is the diversity in the world because uh, we see that uh, it cannot be that something one mm -hmm. is constructed everything else so given a the very first premise it is true then uh, there is no basic element and then the elements are not infinite or they are neutral uh, uh, the last, uh, the last uh, our result or our conclusion uh, is kind of weird someone could say why for example uh, not infinite and neutral is the same yeah uh, neutrality or not infiniteness um, it, uh, is something not, not the same however uh, we can say that uh, it doesn't mean that it is necessary water or something else it's just not infinite that's it uh, uh, so that what uh, wanted uh, Aleximander wanted to tell us that uh, uh, this element first of all not infinite the apron apron Yes, and uh, they are neutral. Uh, all right, let's skip it. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to add that uh, the neutral elements uh, he called apolars. Heraclitus of Ephesus. Yes, years of life. Uh, also, we don't know around um, 500 BC. Uh, belonged to aristocratic family of Ephesus. Uh, he lived like alone, like ascetic and misanthrope, mm -hmm. uh, because he said some things against humanity. Uh, he escaped from Ephesus, lived separately. They say he uh, died also alone, and so on. Uh, he he talked about something that uh, it used to be dialectics. Whether it is not necessary. Um, let's uh, briefly look at some of his um, uh, phrases. Donkeys exchange straw for gold. From one everything appears, and from everything one. This cosmos, uh, one and the same for all that exists, uh, was not created by any gods, no people always was and it will be an, a, an eternally living or a fire that uh, ignites uh, its measures and uh, and matures uh, in measures <coughs> some of that phrase all right there were metaphysics and now we uh, will encounter some of ethics and something else elements of ethics of Heraclitus the fourth, fourth argument the truth is born in the struggle. So, if we want to find the truth, we should struggle for it. It was an argument from Heraclitus. He said, the first premise, uh, the struggle determines who is who. Everything is different. It can, it can show you, you know, for example, you should uh, uh, have a battle. To understand who you are, <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's yeah, it seems really true. 
And it should be noted that uh, this takes into account the provisions of uh, the existence of both one and diversity. All right, the second premise, if everything is one, then only because of diversity. Third one, if everything is diversity, then only as one. Uh, and it is also understand that one and the same are fighting among themselves. Uh, the last one, if we did not exist, then things, uh, all things would be gone. So, uh, everything is diversity. We also uh, had this thought on Anaximandrus. And uh, uh, it, uh, Heraclitus cannot say that everything is one. He repeats in some other way the Anaximander's thoughts. And he wants to say that um, things are interchanging, they are uh, moving, or they are. Uh, trying to combine with uh, all together and so on so things are changing not only be present and uh, metaphysical and natural philosophy of Heraclitus uh, it is difficult to reconstruct his argument but uh, we can try using a fragment of his philosophy we, we, we can try to use it okay so the fifth argument everything changes Okay, so we take into account second and third uh, argument of the previous one, and uh, considering that, uh, then we uh, add in that we can say that everything is one, and there is diversity. So, diversity in unity is ensured through change of things. Uh, so uh, taking into account that previous argument, we want to say that there is a change of things. That change of things cannot exist without the diversity. This, this is an important element. All right. Now we will continue. Pythagoras of Samos. Uh, his uh, history and bio is also not known well enough uh, so also all things we can say is that uh, he uh, turned 40 in 532 BC uh, he created a cult and uh, he was surrounded by his followers uh, maybe most notably uh, for us it's about his famous theory in geometry and also maybe we've heard of him as some kind of one of the first ancient mathematicians who tried to use some also rational techniques like for example Egyptians uh, because um, as Bertrand Russell told us in the history of Western philosophy he said that uh, Pythagoras took um, Egyptians system of proofs or whether uh, uh, I think uh, uh, we also um, could find elements of which in his philosophy but uh, uh, looking at what uh, he created and uh, uh, how he was engaged in all that mysticism oh, I think that uh, the thesis of Bertrand Russell is uh, very plausible alright philosophy of Pythagoras his philosophy is enriched with mystical and religious elements in particular he believed in the reincarnation of souls metamsiosis uh, so these elements are about were taken from Orphix and some other uh, marginal um, teachings. 
uh, and uh, also what he, what we know about him and his philosophy was said by his followers, not by him. So actually speaking, his own thoughts uh, is kind of hard to tell. All right, the elements of ethics of him or maybe his followers. Uh, all right. Uh, the argument sixth, the ideal of pure observation, or start. First premise: people are divided into castes from higher to lower. Of course, in a matter of time, it seems to be like maybe it, uh, it arguments quite quite a sound. Uh, taking into account such teachings as the pyramid of Maslow hmm. is not the same but some structure of that I mean even the modern politics or something quite almost the same all right the second one only ecstatic or sensual inspiration by theories is inherent in the soul close to the divine. It means that that school uh, held the view that uh, you know you should be in some ecstatic um, uh, situation or you should feel less ecstatic to get theories. Uh, the ideal of pure observation is good. The conclusion is uh, well, one of the conclusions of this is the intention to perceive academic scientific life as separate, special. Uh, because mm, there was something mm, quite interesting from one point of view um, that about the scientists, whether mm, the style of thinking of them, I think was taken quite narrow. I mean, the image of scientists in the Pythagorean times was an interesting concept, but was taken some kind of a cut or a, a shot of peculiar system. However, um, it also might be said that mm, uh, the image of uh, a philosopher, because Pythagoras was the first who introduced the term. He called him, himself a philosopher, and uh, that philosopher is some kind of a scientist. So this um, person of Pythagoras must be quite interesting for the history of philosophy. And the image of scientist, which is indeed a philosopher. Um, uh, it, uh, I want to um, make it clearer that I don't want to say that a philosopher is some kind of a higher than scientist. No, vice versa. Uh, scientist is a very important concept. Uh, maybe the one who we think today is a scientist uh, is the one so the scientist must be must have more rights must be more you know have more power as they say but which kind of power it's like freedom be, be, being less engaged in all those consequences like you know for example oh He's got, for example, something like abilities. Oh, yeah, and the, he starts using. No, it doesn't really mean that. Okay, let's uh, leap into the next section Pythagoras Metaphysics or Nature of Philosophy. Uh, okay, argument seven. Everything is a number. <laughs> it's a very famous uh, Pythagoras uh, school. But yes, so, as the existence of nature is ensured by harmony. Space and music, yeah. Harmony exists through relationships. And uh, 
ratios of rational number are numbers. Well, uh, this means that uh, the harmony is some kind of relations, yeah, and uh, those relations are almost everywhere. So those relations are numbered. That's why this uh, this uh, takes us to those very first, very beginning um, narratives of my little school. But however, uh, here is the same. Here is the same for. Uh, here is something also interesting as el elaboration of the thought of Anaximander about limits or the neutral or a non infinite element opera or maybe infinite. Alright. And but that's also from Sicily. Uh, also is unknown his uh, years. He was born to that school of Pythagoras, but he were, he was banned. They say he were told a secret. Uh, he was asked not to talk to. That's why he lost his respect or dignity. Uh, considered air a separate substance. Substance. He also get and also he is known, <laughs> maybe well known, about his teachings of the fourth elements as the moon ones. I don't know uh, whether or not Empedocles was the one who created that view, or maybe he was the follower of it. However. It is true that uh, he was the one who really think of that. He left some scriptures of that. According to the legend, he jumped into the crater of Mount Etna. But um, this is, it is, isn't true. One of Romanian philosopher, I don't remember his name, disproved that view. But actually, he is not very plausible. It doesn't seem to be very plausible. He also did something in medicine, and maybe uh, as um, his other followers. So, here are two other arguments: one of epistemology and one of metaphysics. All right, eight. We know things through their identity to us, because things are identical to us. We can know that, yeah. I mean, if a thing A doesn't match me, that much my senses uh, or perceptions, it's impossible for that thing to uh, get to me, you know, like uh, quite a simple thought. So I can, I, I can uh, um, present it in a more complex way, like, like in here. If A and B have nothing in common, there is no connection between them. Something in the senses uh, learns something else. Parts X and uh, Y are identical. Actually speaking, um, mm, uh, those premises are not constructed really well. Uh, however, and the conclusion is doesn't uh, follow from that. It doesn't really mean because, as I said, the idea is common. Like, for example, let's say you have a triangle hole and a square, uh, wood square, yeah, uh, uh, maybe a triangle, uh, square in the wood and just a piece of square, wooden square, yeah, you want to match them. But if uh, that triangle have, uh, has, for example, uh, it, it, let's say there is a regular triangle and he has, uh, let's say, sides equal to the sides to the square. So there cannot be connection because you cannot push this square through that triangle. So the same. Uh, those particles and anything is it mm, cannot uh, move further. Uh, it doesn't really mean that this thought is simple, but even being simple is a quite powerful thought. 
because even today it, it can be said really well the same. All right, metaphysics or natural philosophy of Empedocles. The doctrine of the four elements: earth, air, fire, and water. The primary substance that make up everything, or the core of that. The dominance of uh, fire gives birth to hate or hatred. Uh, the other elements gives the power to love. So love and hatred are two separate things. Uh, when the fire is set, and he bur it burns. Then uh, it's kind of a dominance and their hatred. One of forces, another is law. Uh, is it seen that in the teaching of Empedocles, you can find here those binary opposition things, and it's not surprising to have him being a poet. Many poets like we were engaged in that stuff. All right, Parmenides of Elia. Uh, also, it's not known to us. It's there's a, a life, but anyway was influenced on those abstract philosophy like for example Pythagoras. He also was a poet. Mm. But I think uh, he was interested in those mm, things like uh, he tried to move closely to logic, ontology, some things. So he was first who tried to elaborate on this or created something on this to understand how can we separate something from something and uh, despite for example what is known what is unknown he tried to take into account si such terms as being I mean he was a pure metaphysician because instead of uh, making um, um, instead of uh, things of just senses ours he tried to take care of uh, something like being like terms all right epistemology of Parmenides arguments 10 the numerical set of sensual things is illusory uh, the one exists everything as one. The one exists as a whole. What exists everywhere as a whole is not divided. Uh, well, sensual things are illusory because um, you cannot divide them. But senses yeah uh, those are like parts just mm, pay attention that that was a uh, very strike to the western idea <laughs> if i can say that against that uh, idea of parts um, maybe i don't know he doesn't like that part I wanted to make an tell the whole that there is a whole as a metaphysical concept and, and it is important that's why this cannot be divided so uh, even uh, uh, at, at the moment I think you can even now see that uh, uh, metaphysicals uh, metaphysics metaphysicians uh, Mm, and some other uh, thinkers uh, of uh, the ancient Greek, uh, they are discussing quite the same terms, quite the same conceptions. Of course, it's some kind of a just a brief formalization. It, it, it can be said that this description is really close to the original. I, I know, but it, it doesn't really mean it means that. Those concepts, as for example, the whole uh, part being being is something it can be said as a whole uh, opposition. I mean interaction between those parts, and 
uh, maybe how many parts, uh, their functional role, uh, and so on. So these things uh, can be uh, taken as some primary ones. Ontology of parmenides. Okay, argument eleven. The way beliefs and the way truth or change done does not exist. There is no change. Right. First one. If we think of something, we use names. Uh, well, this premise uh, can be criticized. However, um, actually, actually, it is not so untrue because uh, usually uh, we try to use words or signs or something, yeah, and that something can be said as name. It doesn't really mean. Is it, is it a sign of something or not? But mm, but it, it can be uh, said as it names. Names denote certain object, and therefore, those certain objects must exist. If we can think of them at any time, they exist at any time. Since we can always think about them, those certain objects do not arise uh, and lost. Yeah. Uh, so, because uh, those certain objects do not arise and not lost, uh, they are not changing. Uh, actually speaking, I think uh, there are numerous of errors, but anyway. Uh, uh, thinking of something, use name, okay. But names denote a certain object. They are denoted, of course, they have reference. But why those objects must exist? No, it maybe it exists in some of way, but it doesn't seem to be also true. Uh, this means like like you know, for example, uh, all what uh, Parmenides wanted to say is that our imagination or our uh, presentations in our heads are not changing. But uh, actually speaking, I think maybe it's an interesting thought saying that our concepts are still our concepts. And quite the same thought was taken by Plato. He aimed this uh, argument against some others, uh, but uh, those a priori uh, thinking. But uh, uh, Actually, the logic of explanation of Parmenides not really well. I, mean, I, I don't think so. Uh, this um, is not really true. All right, there is a classical period, and a person is Socrates, Plato, Aristotle. Uh, these persons are most well known, uh, but uh, now we don't uh, discuss them so much, but also we, 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 I'm going to just pay attention to just some parts of their philosophy. That's it. Okay, Socrates. Uh, of course, he is known as, as I previously said in this lecture. I know, I know nothing is a very famous uh, phrase. Mm. Uh, something called myeptikos. Myeptikos is a Greek term, means like helping other people to get their own thoughts or to extract their own thoughts. Like, you know, for example, let's say I'm a musician, I don't know what, what to say. Uh, Socrates uh, comes to me and says, Oh, Eugene, uh, let me help you to. <laughs> To understand you or to extract you your own thoughts, <laughs> he helps me to uh, understand or maybe to extract my own thoughts from my head. <laughs> that, that, that is Meticus, Ethics and Doctrine of Man. Ah, Socrates. Uh, previously, I mentioned Socrates uh, saying about Confucius. Uh, 
uh, my own thought, my personal thought, that uh, Socrates and Sophists, we didn't mention them, but actually they uh, must have been mentioned. I'll skip it. As, as I said, uh, there is a brief course, we don't mention everyone. However, my personal uh, thought that uh, Socrates was really wrong, and uh, all the same philosophers pay attention to man. Unlike, for example, Pythagoras, who wanted to create an image of philosopher, a scientist, real scientist. Plato was trying to say, for example, uh, this uh, uh, famous words of Delphi Rathlus, a prophet, uh, where Socrates was and uh, heard those words toward to him, and uh, that uh, Delphi Oraculus asked Socrates. Um, to, to know himself, so what what uh, he should know uh, should do is to know thyself, himself, thyself. And Socrates accepted that, but however, I think uh, he should refuse it, saying, for example, if you try to understand the world, the whole world, there you don't need to understand thyself. Uh, why to understand thyself if you need to understand the whole world? Understanding the whole world is, it is, it includes the understanding of thyself. It is, it is the same. You, you can separate them. And separating them was, was not a good thing. Actually, in the Socrates philosophy, you, you can find those, some, some pro problems. Uh, the first one is uh, where is Socrates and where is Plato? Because most of it, uh, as we can see from these uh, uh, messages, Plato mentions Socrates uh, in about of his twenty works. However, Xenophanes and Antisthenes just one word. So we don't know really well about Socrates' really teachings. However, we trust to Plato. Um, also, Socrates used, like, for example, uh, abstractions to create logic, um, talking about notions, uh, used irony, uh, endurance, so on. But uh, most of the time, I think Socrates was just uh, like a prophet, uh, like a prophet. Uh, he was a trigger. He was rather a trigger. Yeah. Okay. Something we will take because uh, a couple of arguments because they are famous. Okay. Arg argument twelve: A relativity good person is only one who is aware of X. Oh, that that good. Okay. The first premise: X intends to do A to do good. Next one. Uh, relative to mu, x is not aware of a. Therefore, the third premise. Performing a, x can do both good and bad. Uh, let's me continue first. If a then b, not a, then doesn't mean anything. Uh, Socrates wanted to to show us that uh, you can do good only when you know what is good. Let's first of all say that if I, for example, don't know what is red, it doesn't mean I can create red things. It doesn't imply this. So actually speaking, Socrates' arguments was wrong in the beginning. That's it. Uh, most of the time, Socrates traveled to his companions and asked about that. What is a prophet? There is no end. 
logic or interrogative logic of Socrates. Interrogative logic an interesting part of logic. But uh, more, uh, mostly it's quite the same logic uh, transformed into some, uh, into some predicate logics. But here it's just an just, um, illustration of something like interrogative logic. Argument 13. Uh, if an expert of, on X known X, he also know that there is truth. Uh, briefly, I, I don't want to step by step uh, pay attention to this, but want to say um, you should know, for example, uh, what is X if you know what is it X. Yes, uh, and you know the truth. It's, it's quite it's quite the same as the previous one, but uh, this time. Uh, Socrates don't want, or Plato, anyway, uh, wanted to say that you should know what is good, uh, but, but that you are an expert on this. X. This claim is closer to the truth, of course, because, for example, if, uh, let's say, I'm an expert in architect, for example, and I create uh, a building, yeah, then, uh, I, I, it, it means that I, I know that the true, uh, what is true. Uh, but at the same moment, this argument can be um, understood as um, uh, conversion, conversion of that uh, premise, uh, statement. Uh, what is it? I mean. If something knows what is true, he can do something, be an expert. Uh, so unlike knowing the good, he should know the truth, I think, without any commentaries. Because th th this argument is, of course, broken. Plato. I don't want to pay attention about his biography, uh, but he is a well-known as being founder of the Academy. It's also well-known for... Uh, giving us so many uh, writings, he left us so those writings we can view them. Many philosophers, mostly Socrates and talks to others. Yeah, mm. there are some other problems with the philosopher Plato, like for example, uh, which. Uh, parts of his writings belong to Plato is on one side. Another one, if for example, the order, I mean, uh, which works were earlier published or write, written, um, and so on. But actually speaking, I think all of that is some kind of a historical events. Who cares about that? Um, uh, we are interested in, met in philosophy. Philosophy is, what is it? Like, for example, the concepts like Plato's Cave, the Doctrine of Two Worlds, the Doctrine of Ideas and Eidos, some political ideas. Uh, yeah, and the very famous one, philosophers at the head of an ideal state, I mean, must be, <laughs> has his, uh, his um, statement from the work of Plato called Republic. All right, the first cut. Uh, it's almost impossible to cover even a small part of Plato's philosophy. Uh, in the apt words of the English Plato American, philosopher Norton Alfred Whitehead said, Old post Platonist philosophy only comments on it. I mean, what we have, what we have got, uh, all that. Is all the, uh, only comments to Plato's works already. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, Plato described too many things and so on. But honestly speaking, I think such concepts as, for example, uh, Aristotle's um, or like Diogenes or something are also philosophy. And maybe Stoics, 
so others. Mm, I can say that Plato was father or founder to all the next conceptions. No, I cannot say that, but actually speaking, I, I mostly agree with Nurtal Alfred Whitehead because, of course, Plato was very not notable. Elements of Plato's logic, argument 15. Division into categories and subcategories. A subcategory is selected to be defined. Uh, the category to which it belongs uh, and the features that distinguish it from the other subcategories are determined. There are uh, no other definitions. Uh, this means, like, for example, there's cat categories and subcategories. Uh, actually speaking, is some kind of um, just method. Uh, you can have um, categories and subcategories. So that's it. Nothing, nothing important. However, um, uh, it it it's also important that that any category is being uh, descri described uh, by its subcategories. Elements of Plato's epistemology. Argument fifteen. Remembrance. Uh, uh, this uh, yeah this uh, important term uh, remembers just recalling recalling from memory. Let X uh, tries to find out about A something. If X does not know which A, what A is, that he cannot find A. And uh, if X knows which uh, A, then it makes no sense to know about A. Everything that X knows about A, and he knows in advance. This means okay. So, uh, if you want to find something, you should know what to find. Yeah, and uh, if you already know about it, then why to find it? Yeah, it's really interesting. Uh, whether I think uh, Plato was like was toying us, or uh, <clears throat> uh, thought that uh, we we are not aware of uh, like complex interactions. I mean, for example, mm, uh, if you have, for example, four elements uh, by two. Let's say two from one side and two, two from the other side, and you want to find those interactions. Uh, it, then you don't know uh, the consequences consequences of that, but you want to find out their consequences and uh, the interactions of them is something that you are looking for and. Uh, when you have all those four elements, two by two sides, you cannot say that you know everything. You want to check this out, to think. Um, well, this this uh, an interesting point. However, um, I think it fails when uh, Plato claims that uh, if you knows what it is then you don't need to pursue pursue in it no it's not true you can pursue a thing uh, because you don't know uh, the inferences of it okay uh, another part argument 16 Plato's theory of ideas theory of universals first premise if a thing a one uh, had the form B, then thing A2 may have the form B. Also. Whatever thing X is, it will always be possible to have a B shape. So, form exists even when there is no specific thing. Uh, this means, like, for example, 
what uh, we understand as a predicate. It can be criticized or it can be um, uh, combined with uh, different subjects. I mean, one predicate can have different subjects, and because like for example let's say for example uh, there may be a red uh, dress or red apple or I don't know a red cat <laughs> or red hair uh, so different things yeah but the same color by Plato's logic it means that this redness exists by itself I think uh, absolutely it's a pointless uh, uh, notification. Okay, the argument 15. Elements of Plato's political philosophy. The states according to Plato, citizens are divided according to the caste system, as like Pythagoras said. The government controls people knowledge. Such a uh, state uh, ensures justice. Uh, here, uh, I, I, I'm not going to discuss the political um, side of Plato's philosophy. It's an interesting one. However, uh, it makes us to dive into it more uh, deeper. Uh, and I think it's, it's not a discussion for this time. But, what can be said? For example, this caste system, yeah? There's higher hierarchy, hierarchy. Well, hierarchical systems, uh, from my point of view, are broken. That's something uh, is not very living. It seems to be, but actually no. Uh, more stable systems quite can be adapted to different uh, conditions. It's like adaptations, not just. Uh, to be hierarchical or something, no. Uh, uh, this is one point of view. Uh, co controlling the people's knowledge or interests, <laughs> yeah, uh, in uh, such no famous as 1984 by George Orwell. Uh, you can read about that and some other totalitarian things. Very famous one even today in some totalitarian countries, as for example, or terroristic ones as Russia. Uh, so you can fight it, and uh, uh, well, this is of course a bad point. And uh, Plato uh, explained it, saying that hmm, you know those hierarchy must be upholded, must be controlling. No. It's something it's from really broken. And uh, <laughs> such a state ensures justice, yeah, of course. I don't think that it, that work of Plato, the concept of justice was presented. Of course, no. The form of his work you know, uh, I think it uh, says, uh, I mean, while you're reading it, you can be impressed by the style or some arguments within it. However, you know, it seems like a fake, like a failure. So reading Plato reading some kind of, you know, pebbles or modern on those racists, uh, propaganda makers, and so on. Seems like that. So it need to be care. Uh, in this book, Republic, Plato described a cave. Plato's cave. Um, here is a cave. You can see on the left side uh, those prisoners. They are stare the wall. Uh, behind them, you can see some holes, and through the holes, uh, there is a light that comes from that. There are shadows, 
appears uh, the walls <laughs> whether by, by it's interesting to say that those prisoners also should see uh, uh, see those I mean uh, shadows of the, them all I don't understand how they should do this actually uh, this concept of Plato is just an illustration I don't think it's a good one there are many points but you know it, it can be represented to our system for example watching YouTube watching YouTube staring to that videos uh, watching it for why sometimes a person must ask himself why is he doing it all that staring into phone I don't think it, it, it's some way out but it, it also doesn't mean that, for example, it is a necessary bad thing. I mean, uh, our habits, our, uh, our uh, actions may lead us into a pit, but they may not. <laughs> okay, Aristotle, biography of Aristotle, his uh, founding of Lysia, Alicia, uh, mm, as well as Plato, uh, Aristotle was a founder of Lysians. Is uh, um, the school uh, is also, I mean, the followers of Aristotle are called peripathetics, peripathetical school. Uh, they say that uh, it's because they were uh, working at the Lysians. I don't really know whether or not is it true. Uh, there are many rumors, but anyway. Because uh, when you work in uh, speak, it's a possible way. However, I don't think that a big group of people can do this. Maybe pairs of people can do this. Not anyway. Um, uh, works of Aristotle. Mm. There are also many uh, works left. You can check them out. Uh, I think uh, it's much more interesting than, than Plato's. Interesting in which way? Because usually Aristotle tries to describe uh, mm, the concepts of philosophy itself, uh, and not only in philosophy, like for example in astronomy, uh, such as the first astro astronomer as Ptolemaeus, who is known by his system that uh, were aimed uh, by astronomers until Nicholas Copernicus and uh, Ptolemaeus in his uh, um, work I forgot the name unfortunately uh, he mentioned Aristotle and that there are lines saying that uh, he he thought that uh, Aristotle was some kind of a mm, even more <laughs> a, uh, more deep thinker of that, mm, and uh, Almagest. Uh, 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 mm, now I remember the name of it, Almagest. And Almagest, Ptolemy said that uh, he accepted the theory of Aristotle uh, uh, as it is. Okay, some basic ideas of him. First and second philosophy, and first and second uh, deities. The doctrine of causes for causes. Basic logical epistemolo epistemological ideas. The doctrine of categories and Aristotle's, uh, let's say, organos. Basic ethical ideas, virtues and aristocracy, and the doctrine of golden middle. Um, first and second philosophy, what does it mean? Uh, like, you know, uh, there is a primary or the secondary uh, things. Um, the primary things uh, which are they exist for their own. Like, for example, what is number? Yeah, I can ask, what is number? Uh, 
which uh, uh, science asked about it in the philosophy so it was like first deities and uh, second deities or secondary deities is about attributes or something like for example how this number can be added to the other number and so on it's just particular cases they are not so stable or something this way that secondary things second philosophy so the first philosophy is like almost like theologies uh, dealing with things as for example God might have deal in the second philosophy can be said something like science but there is also I think important something uh, it seems that uh, Aristotle uh, uses that conception of a scientist and a philosopher like uh, from his prism of view from his angle of view or a point of view and I guess mm, it doesn't pay attention much to a scientist as some kind of a real freedom person or something like that right the doctrine of causes there are um, four causes material formal uh, teleological one and uh, one of creator uh, all right uh, elements of Aristotle's metaphysics the doctrine of four cases so let's uh, take a look at this more precisely uh, the first premise uh, B will occur under condition A B is a consequences consequence that is observed therefore if A is not a carrier it must be a form or a carrier is the same as a matter matter uh, if A is not a form, then A is an intention, or a point, or a destination of X. If A is not the intention of X, then A is the purpose of X. Uh, two of X. Uh, actually speaking, all, only matter and form is something like for example a carrier is is like something stable and a form is something can be changed uh, actually speaking all of that can be grounded into mm, one form of tablet um, but actually there are two important points I also think that uh, it's not very good to lose them. Anyway, mm, it's a destination of X uh, or a final cause. Mm. And uh, as a tool, as a creator, as something as an intention. Alright. Elements of Aristotle's ontology. Argument 17. Argument from so called the third here. Aristotle was well known as a critic to Plato theory of uh, universals or forms. So Aristotle criticized the theory of forms of Plato. And here is one of his uh, famous uh, objections. To Plato's theory of forms. Uh, if for any A1 there must be a form B, Y, and for of any A2 there must be a form B, J, then for any B, Y and B, J there must be a form B, K. 
I gave four uh, any B and and B and plus there must be a four B and plus two and so on. Mm. Uh, let's generalize that, saying that uh, you know, for example, uh, if like for example, if two elements uh, have forms for each of that elements, there must be a form. For those two forms and uh, also forms of those forms and so on so this formalization is is kind of an endless process uh, this is also it uh, all right Aristotle's logic actually speaking we will try to um, uh, discuss this logic later in the lecture of logic. However, we want to say that uh, unlike, for example, Stoic Stoicists, Aristotle thought that logic was just a tool, just a tool, uh, and he was first who systematized logic and invented many interesting things like syllogisms. He explained by it um, those fake um, sophistries and some other uh, uh, para, uh, paraphrases and some other things uh, which previous philosophers used and so on. Alright, period of Hellenism. We skip all that historic information. Alright, Stoicism. Greek and Roman Stoicism it can be separated Basical metaphysical and logical teachings, Epicureanism, uh, the person of Epicurus and his followers, the physical and ethical teachings of Epicurus, cynicism, logical antisthenes, life and teachings of Diogenes, Epsilon, and skepticism, and skepticism uh, at the Platonic Academy, basic provisions and principles. So here are uh, three. Famous states, or whether there are much more others. Zeno of Gideon, the founder of it. Chrysippus, who is uh, most well known by his logician theories. And uh, Seneca. Right. General characteristics of Stoicism. Uh, uh, the whole universe can be divided into three. Logic is some kind of a the most structure of it, the most structure of the world. Physics is like, for example, you know, like the materials on that structure. And ethics is what can uh, that system gives us, what can it produces. So anything that it produces is the results, and there is ethics. This is it. So ethics is some kind of a part of all those processes that are immanent to the nature, plus logic. Also logos, uh, uh, Stoics, mm, more or less, they will followers of Heraclitus philosophy think that the fire was um, a very important element and this they say that that fire was specifically is something the fire within us is also can be combined in all those category of Jane by Confucius uh, I'm not surprised by it here and all this because in the period Hellenism, many cultures were mixing some teachings from Oriental philosophy captured into Western philosophy and so on. He also talks about epicatastasis, uh, Pythagorean teachings about transformed souls. And apathy is lack of passion. <laughs> um, it's like you know, for example, why should we put some emotions if 
it says cannot be changed here why to scream if if you cannot change anything by your screen instead of screaming you should be calm that's it all right a philosophy of Zeno of Sidious okay on. argument 18 Atorex. all right in order to magnify the will and fill it with the best qualities the acceleration of the will must be reduced uh, the will change should be preference for reactions to external events the stronger the will the greater the resistance to the external change so those are inner will if we do not put it according to the nature there appears a force of our struggle and needless because by Zeno and Stoics the nature is stronger than us nature is something like our um, alpha and omega and that's why we cannot change it so we don't need it only to adopt ourselves also 19 uh, elements of metaphysics of Zeno Sutton arguments 19 good and evil good and evil depend in trial on the will uh, if the will is good and there is nothing to that will can clear it just do what <laughs> what the nature told you and uh, this is okay so there you are here are Epicurus and Titus Leclerc car is all famous Epicureans so what is it general characteristics of Epicureanism picture of the Epicurean world practice and physics so there are physical and practical things. usually it's mostly it's like physics mm. Epicurus was a pen of saying that everything was a physics and this uh, it was uh, created by atoms and maples uh, without tele there are no purpose teleology uh, he also taught that ataraxia called moderation balance are more preferred unlike uh, stoics epicurus uh, wanted to say that uh, we should be calm or balance because uh, like you know you you should uh, he used to say that uh, live in silence or live in peace should live in peace and silence and without any hesitations from doing something so the calmness is the one and the purpose you should not to bother your own soul those passions are of course uh, not very good however if those passions don't want to bother you because you should you should not waste them anything like that let's closer to fight okay uh, elements of epistemology of epicurus arguments 12 life fights fear yeah as long as a person has any sense of the dangers of life he is still alive fear is just one of those feelings not the best because it influences uh, with others and therefore life can overcome fear actually speaking I do like this argument of Epicurus why that uh, first of all when we are alive why to be afraid of death because de when we are death <laughs> there should be no hesitations but actually speaking our fear uh, can be only a barrier mm, uh, it doesn't mean that passions or emotions are absolutely unnecessary no they are necessary however they should be limited uh, we should pay attention to the, the fact that our passions and so on must be uh, must work as brakes so we must be aware of it however the rational things is, is also important elements of epicurus metaphysics argument 21 atoms and metals the movement of metals if the world consists of elementary particles they are either uh, indelible or moving 
if they are moving in the separate lower full of them, they are so by nature. If they move, it is a separate love or rule for them, and they act by nature. If it is separate love of who it must be a elementary particle, consequently an element of nature. So, mobility or mobility occurs by nature. Indescrutable is an atom, and driving is an apple. It means like, for example, atoms is also, also that in, is moving by nature, but maples can change it. I would say it's a good addition to those Stoics teachings. Hmm. I, I want to say that uh, Epicurus views are interesting and must be viewed most notably because this is just really important. They should be elaborated, um, however, not this time. Cynicism, like Antisthenes and Diogenes. Well, they are no punks in the ancient philosophy. They are punks, yeah. Like, or prankers, as modern. Um, Alright, so hedonism against disagreement. Yeah. No world catastrophes. To turn away from participation in the world because from the very beginning, it is full of madness and evil. To seek salvation, to escape or cancel, not outside but in oneself. Sociality and sociality. Uh, cynicism uh, was talking about uh, those social chains usually are not very good because society as a group of people don't do rational. They act like more like animals, and they have to be, you know, waking up. It's like the movie The Life from uh, 1989, uh, when the phrase, like, this world is asleep, we should become a uh, uh, clock for, for those worlds, yeah. We should wake the world up. <laughs> so there must be it. Okay, Diogenes philosophy, uh, social philosophy, argument 22. I would like to plunder all the coins in the world. When drawing the attention of others uh, to the essence of things, Diogenes thus wanted to influence the opinions of others. Uh, the father of Diogenes was uh, a criminal who spoiled or plundered some coins. And the genius <laughs> wanted to say he wanted to to wake the world up by plundering all the cons in the world. Of course, he used to say that metaphoric, metaphorical uh, ethics of Diogenes, true virtues. Argument twenty three: uh, Freedom cannot be a hostage of individual good. Indifference to certain benefits, freedom. Uh, all right, let's skip it. Skeptics, Piro and Sextus Empiricus. Uh, skeptics are, I would say, maybe more uh, m most interesting among the others, or whether we cannot waste many time on them. All right, <laughs> a picture of the world of skepticism, as you can see this dash, <laughs> because what skeptics know, <laughs> they know nothing. What can they say about uh, it's an interesting to know that uh, skeptics usually say that they know nothing whether uh, what about the reports so what they want to report us about but they don't want anything but it's some kind of a knowledge all right uh, doc doctrine uh, we uh, we don't know yeah and the prior position is like uh, we do not know. Uh, we uh, also don't know what we don't know. <laughs> We're not aware of it. Uh, without tell, of course, without any teleology. And epoche. They practiced uh, that epoche. It's like absistence from judgments. It's like uh, talking no judgments. Trying to, instead of saying something dogmatic, saying indogmatic. Right, last two. Mm. 
but there are two arguments left. 24. There is no truth. If a certain x is true, this is either true or false. Yeah? Uh, if it's true, it has to be measured somehow. For to measure, we have to have a criteria. Either the criteria is x or not x. Uh, there is a circle or there is another truth to check. This means like any criteria is uh, very weak. Uh, none of criteria cannot be said to understand whether or not is it truth. So this is a summary. And the last one, argument 25. <laughs> there are no arguments. So here is a, a statement. Neoplatonism, the influence of Christian religious teachings and Hellenism of the world. Uh, we don't, I'm not going to discuss it. As you can see, there are many mm, the transfers from as religious and uh, Plato, sometimes Aristotle teachings. However, nothing, something really important if you want to. Mm, just take the general picture. I think uh, Neoplatonics is it's interesting to read uh, in particulars. All right, thank you for watching. Glory to Ukraine. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye.